Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. Got a jam-packed show for you today. I was happy to see Lionel Messi, one of soccer's all-time greats, just to win away from the elusive prize. I kind of want you to be in the same scenario. What's your elusive prize? Mine is a golden retirement. I feel like I started to work at age 14, scooping ice cream. It feels like, when do I get a break? <laughs> oh, the complaints I have. Uh, NASDAQ was a winner yesterday, but not a great one after we got what we needed to from the CPI number, consumer price inflation. Today, we're going to have to get through the Fed. Are we going to get Jerome Powell who comes out and is talking tough? Or are we going to get Jerome Powell who said, it looks like it's working? Or are we going to get Jerome Powell who says, we're going to be data dependent in 2023? Or are we going to get a Jerome Powell who's going to be defiant and say, we're not lowering interest rates in 2023? That's what we're looking for. And there's a positive break and there's a negative break to how he performs today. NASDAQ, S&P, and Dow all were winners yesterday, but not big winners. Again, I don't know if the proof is in the figgy pudding. What is figgy pudding? If it's figs, that's disgusting. But the proof will be in the pudding today with Jerome Powell. Ten-year treasury sits at 3.5%. Interest rates have been going lower. Interesting to know that mortgage applications have been ticking higher. We'll talk about that in the second segment of the day. The Bureau of Labor Statistics said that inflation continued to slow its role in November as U.S. consumer prices rose just one-tenth of a percent from the previous month compared to a year ago. Prices are up 7.1%. Month-to-month, very tame. Year-over-year, pretty obnoxiously high. What got more cheap? Is that a word? Is that a phrase? Am I allowed to say that? More cheaper? Um, now I sound like a fourth grade uh, English student. Bad news if you're a Sally Guzley and Red Wings fans, produce and sports tickets were amongst the goods with the highest monthly price increases. That sounds about right. Entertainment, whether it's Bad Bunny, whether it's Ty- Taylor Swift, I must change the name to Tyler Swift. I would have got some hate on that. Or whether it's sporting events, tickets have gone crazy up. Buying health insurance and heating your home with natural gas got cheaper, though energy costs overall remain eye-poppingly expensive on a year-over-year type of level. Let's move on and hit some other top stories of the day. Um, Elon Musk, no longer the richest man in the world. He has fallen to Bernard Arnault, the co-founder and CEO of the French conglomerate Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy. Twitter has not paid rent for its San Francisco headquarters or its other global offices in recent weeks as it tries to trim costs. Ford's electric F-150 was named Motor Trend's truck of the year. United Airlines is making a big bet on air travel, buying 100 Boeing 787 Dreamliners. When you're making a big bet on airlines and you're saying your revenues and earnings are going to be better than expected in 2023, the airline industry is looking pretty healthy. Would I invest in it? I would strongly consider it. But when it comes to the final decisions, you and I have to make our own final decisions. OPEC slashed its growth forecast for the first quarter, citing global headwinds that will require vigilance and caution. The Ego Company, I didn't even know this was a thing, was fined $85,000 because it released some toxic gas in their San Jose factory last year. They took a little bit too long to report it to authorities. And because of that, it was kind of a a tougher cleanup for the city of San Jose or the county of Santa Clara is probably the right way of saying this. Positive news, you know, all that mRNA, biotechnology, biology lessons that we learned last year, two years ago, three years ago with the mRNA vaccines. Preliminary results yesterday indicate that an experimental mRNA cancer vaccine from Moderna was effective against melanoma when combined with Merck's immunotherapy known as Keytruda. The combo reduced the risk of recurrence or death by 44% compared to those who received Keytruda alone. Vaccines featuring MRA technology are going to be more common. It is going to be one of the blessings that comes out of COVID. Keep in my mind, 
keep in mind, my mother passed from COVID. Every member of my family got COVID eventually in June of 2022. We had avoided it for a long time. I feel the vaccines helped my family. I feel COVID killed my mother. Um, was she old? Did she have other issues? Yes. But a million plus Americans died, and I'm not a denialist um, in any way, shape, or form. And that's my speech of the day. But vaccines featuring mRNA technology most commonly used in COVID for what you and I know so far are currently being tested against various cancers, but none have received FDA approval yet. Melanoma accounts for the majority of skin cancer deaths in America. I find that to be very promising. Probably not going to be seeing an FTX Super Bowl commercial this year with Tom Brady or Matt Damon. Probably not going to happen with Larry David. FTX represents one of the worst business failures ever seen in the last 12 months. It's uh, as big as Enron. The CEO who had to go in to clean up the Enron mess is the same CEO who's going in to clean up the FTX mess. And yesterday, Sam Bankman Freed was in the Bahamas. He was arrested. He was charged with eight counts, including wire fraud and conspiracy in the United States. This is one of the biggest frauds in American history. Like, you're going to hear the big voiced guy, Sam Bankman Freed, genius or mastermind. And I heard one of the funniest things I heard, and this is just, it's a little bit sexist, it's a little bit misguided i don't think it's bad but cnbc broadcasters were talking about uh the young woman caroline who was re running alameda the hedge fund and they said it looks like she was a 12 year old ceo she's just a young woman who looks really really young but with all the stories of debauchery and sex and drugs it kind of one of those moments you're like she does look a little young and she does look like she's 12. And wow, why is a 12-year-old running a company? And I'll, I'll be honest, let's do a quick comparison here. In the 1990s, uh, the dot-com stocks got a little bit crazy. In the early, uh, mid-2000s, uh, in the 2000, early 2000s, mid-2000s, I don't know what you call it, 2005, 2006, 2007. But you saw CEOs of companies like Facebook, and you're like, Mark Zuckerberg looks a little bit young. Or you'd see the CEO of Box or Dropbox, and you go, these guys look like they just got out of high school. And in a way they did because they dropped out of college. So uh, that's out there. But the CEO, Ray, who's now running FTX and trying to clean it up and trying to find money for the bankruptcy for people who got frauded. He said that uh, they used it in uh, QuickBooks. And he goes, how does a billion dollar company with $32 billion in finances use QuickBooks? <clears throat> Software for small businesses that you can straight up get it best buy. One minute. And Sam Bankman Freed used your accounts as a personal piggy bank, siphoning away money for his hedge fund, Alameda, to buy real estate, make political donations. Williams, is, uh, the U.S. attorney, said that Sam Bankman Freed wrongfully made political donations with FTX customer money to buy partisan influence and impact the direction of public policy. This is a mess. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. Taking a look at the markets today, um, it's all about the Fed, in my opinion. And when they announced their 50 base bump, what do they say afterwards? So then we get to Christmas. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial. Don't want to work forever? Check out the Retirement Planning Guide on robblack.com. That's robblack.com, powered by EP Wealth. Nearly half of American workers are hoping for a promotion or a raise in 2023. I get it. If inflation ease goes up 2 to 3% a year on average, which is weird because this is what CFP Chad Burton and I used to say, and then it's up 7% this year, and you can say, like, ooh, we want raises of 2 to 3%. Inflation's going up 2 to 3%. We want to stay ahead of the game. So nearly half of Americans want to get a promotion or a raise. And if not, you're going to have some discontent, and you're going to have some fear out there from individuals. 
first segment of the show, I talked about mortgage demand inching higher as interest rates move lower. Mortgage applications to purchase a home rose 4% in the last week and were 38% lower than the same week a year ago. So again, month to month, it's looking good. Year to year, it's looking dry. Let's talk a little bit about this concept and more with Tony Mendez, host of Bay Area. Um, what you, the Real Estate Report is the show you do, but the website is BayAreaLoanSource.com. It's BayAreaLoanSource.com, and it's Real Estate Report. Good Heard today on KDOW, 2 p.m., right? Yes, good morning. And then there's a replay tomorrow at 6 p.m. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about this. Mortgage demand is inching higher as interest rates have moved lower. It's a little bit of a shadow move in the last 30 days, but the 10-year Treasury stopped playing with 4.2% and it said, you know, we're more comfortable down around 3.5%. Did that change your world a little bit? Yeah, we we enjoy seeing the, the rates go up and down. People are paying attention to these fluctuations, uh, I mean, it was a lot of good relief after a 20 year high at 7.08. Depending on where you go, you're, you're pricing at two to almost three months lows on interest rates. And it's been a really good reaction from the market. So, kind of the wrong timing. I mean, this is the slow time of the year, but the buyers that are out there are really enjoying that, uh, you know, they have the ability to do long term locks. If, you know, you're looking at something even in the spring, you can lock these rates right now if you fear that rates will continue to go up. What is a long term lock and what is the downside? What if the rate continues to go lower? Uh, long term lock is anything over, you know, the typical 30, 60 days. Uh, most okay. lenders will actually go up to 90 without even um, blinking an eye. But now they go up to 180 days. Some lenders charge a fee for that. So you have to be really careful about locking that in and okay. doing an upfront fee. But it can save you a lot of money if you do so and you're locking in a good rate. Um, the downside is if rates go down, what do you do? So some lenders let you float down. We have a uh, we work with a couple wholesale lenders that allow you to float down within the last 15 days of that lock, if rates are better, or you just switch lenders. You have to remember you have a fee that you may have paid. Okay, so that's what a long term lock is, and it's being used. Who's the typical person who would use a long term lock? Just someone who's insecure about direction of rates, or is it something bigger than that? Um, builders are, uh, you know, if you're builders. building a house and you see the rates are working in your favor, they, you would lock in um, usually through the period of, of that build. But now a lot more people who are seeing these huge rate uh, fluctuations are saying, you know, I want to lock it in, even though I'm not going to be buying for another three or four months from now. So anyone can use them. Okay. Now let's go to the concept of, and I, you and I were talking yesterday about some ideas for today's show. And it dawned on me that I bought a home in my 20s, late 20s, in my 30s, in my 40s, and now in my 50s. Um, I have a couple rental properties in there. I've got a couple homes that I've lived in. I've got a vacation home or a second home. Um, interesting that I'm, I'm, I'm breaking it down in decades and um, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, I feel like it's been very good to me in the big picture, but every time I do it, I'm nervous. Let's talk about people who buy on a regular basis. I think you coined this yesterday. It's not about timing the market. It's about time in the market. It's a long-term game. Um, you know, we, we, I bought homes in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, so I missed the 20s. Uh, I wish I did buy something in the 20s. And I think I would probably would turn – say that I was lucky that I bought in my 20s, but I didn't. But I was lucky I bought in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. It's The time in the market is really the key here. And mm -hmm. I think this the luck part is all about, did you buy it in a down market or midway or in the top of the market? And that just changes how soon you can do your next transaction and really improve that uh, upon your portfolio in real estate. Um, I, I don't know if I want to use the word luck. I think, and a lot of people, especially investors, like to say, well, I timed it perfectly. Uh, and then look back at it and say, I was lucky. But I, I don't know. It's kind of a weird concept to think that, you know, you, the more you get into real estate, the more you feel like you're lucky. I've bought on some short-term lows and sold in some short-term highs. So I feel luck. 
but for me, it has been time in the market. And it's worthy of note that you and I once rented an apartment together. And we had another roommate, Mark, who <laughs> was kind of a gym rat. It was kind of fun. Um, we could have afforded a home in our 20s. Like we could have afforded a rental b- property and then we could have left it and made money for lifetime. Um, but we were too living in the moment. We were too much like, what do we do at New Year's Eve? Um, I don't know if that's worthy of, of, of talking, but sometimes you could pull together your rents and, and, and afford a monthly mortgage. Well, that's certainly happening. And you have to be careful when you when you buy real estate together, the thing in real estate is if you want to lose a friend, buy real estate together. But that's what people are doing now. Uh, if you're renting now and you have a neighbor and you walk over to your neighbor and say, let's buy a place, we're already renting now. Why don't we buy a duplex? That, that's happening. People are getting together and buying property. But going back to you know being young and saying, oh, we could have pulled our money together and bought a property. Now it's a little bit harder. Um, it, when you and I were making you know a certain amount of money back in our 20s and 30s, we could look around and find inventory that actually fit our budget. You know, maybe we had to put something else together, a little bit more down payment, but there was always something there. That's the big problem that a lot of people are looking at now is just the inventory is, is just, it's it's anemic and it's expensive and you have the higher interest rate. So it's been a lot harder for people to say, I feel lucky getting into real estate and saying, oh, we need a house. We just had a kid. Let's buy a house. It just doesn't happen like that anymore. I think we need a lot more preparation and and we need prices and rates to cooperate. That's why you're seeing such more activity right away when you see these rates drop and you see mortgage applications spike because people are really paying attention. They really need that that break in that, that uh, overall cost. Well, it's fun talking real estate with you. We'll talk again in a week and you and I will talk off air. Thanks very much. It's Tony Mendez. You can find him at BayAreaLoanSource.com. It's BayAreaLoanSource.com. You can find his podcast at KDOW.biz or listen to a show live. And there's a way to listen to it live online as well. You can listen to him and Gordon. Gordon is quite an entrepreneur. He's someone who is um, wildly intelligent, whereas I think Tony's more of the average regular man with good intelligence. Um, check them out today at 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock here on KDOW. I'm Rob Black. This interview featured on The Rob Black Show is brought to you by EP Wealth. Learn more at robblack.com. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial money, investing, and more. Find me online at robblackshow.com. Hopefully, you're having a good holiday season. Will the Grinch come out today, i.e. Jerome Powell, and talk about how inflation is 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 bad and it's not going to go away in 2023? Or will we get kind of a Christmas miracle, if you will, and Jerome Powell softens up on the inflation barking and the interest rate expectations? Let's go to the one, the only briefing.com to talk a little about what we're seeing out there. Um, <clears throat> Patrick O'Hare, briefing.com. Patrick, we're going to get a Grinch or a Christmas miracle today. What do you think? <laughs> um, I think we'll have some a little bit closer to a Grinch, but uh, a Grinch that still has a little bit of a heart uh, that's beating, uh, but probably not going to be as uh, as market friendly as, as a lot of people would would hope. Um, you know, I think that the Fed chair all year, uh, well, since they've started raising rates and have gotten into it, has really tried to drive home the point that, um, you know, the Fed needs to be vigilant in this effort to get inflation back down to the 2% target. And it would rather risk doing too much to do that as opposed to too little. And even though, you know, there was a nice moderation in the consumer inflation rate, it's still north of 7%. And there's still clear signs of strength in the labor market. Um, and average hourly earnings were up, you know, 5.1% year over year in November. I think that the Fed is going to have to, uh, or will be inclined anyway, to emphasize the, you know, the ongoing strength in the labor market, as well as inflation that is still too high as a basis for, um, you know, for basically, you know, sticking to their game plan. And that's to, uh, you know, to continue to raise the Fed funds rate uh, and uh, and to try and, uh, you know, really kill this inflation bug. You can steal that whole Grinch thing for tomorrow's morning column if you want to. 
just <laughs> give me a shot. My mind for today's column, as a matter of fact. So Isn't it funny? Like, we yeah. do the same thing every year. Like it's yes. it's always is it going to be a Grinch Christmas? Is it going to be a Christmas miracle? We just keep dipping into the same content. Well, and I'm embarrassed that you said you were thinking about it because I thought I was clever. <laughs> um, well, you know, Let's just say the Fed's going to fall where they're going to fall today, and we'll deal with that this afternoon and tonight. Where are we in the other parts of the economy? Um, I see the airlines are announcing really good numbers for 2023. Um, the World Cup has bought, brought people back into restaurants and bars. We're seeing a little bit of that going on. Where would you put the pulse of the U.S. economy right now? Should we be thinking recession? Should we be thinking tightening the belts and feeding the kids rice instead of uh, regular meals? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think the you know the economy is definitely in a, in a downshift mode. Okay. Um, there are certain pockets that are you know still humming along. It sounds like um, you know airline travel is is faring okay anyway, but. The stocks themselves have not done all that great because uh, investors are worried about what, you know, basically those long and variable lags of monetary policy kicking in in 2023 and ultimately, you know, crimping demand for travel and other discretionary spending activities. Um, So, you know, I think that, you know, that's the big issue as we go into 2023, right? It's just how pronounced will the the lags of the Fed's rate hikes throughout 2022 turn out to be? Uh, And, you know, you're starting to see some cracks, obviously, in in the housing market. Um, You're seeing some now emerge in the labor market, you know, with uh, layoff announcements and whatnot. Uh, But, you know, it's not a... It's not a major break yet. I think, you know, I think by most accounts, the labor market is still running pretty, pretty strong. Um, You can see that in the JOLTS jobs openings numbers. Um, You can see it in a 3.7 percent unemployment rate. You see it every week, it seems like, in the relatively low level of initial claims. Uh, And while continuing claims have popped up, suggesting maybe it's a little more challenging to find a new job, um, you're still, you know, seeing, um, you know, employers by and large reluctant to to cut those employees uh, because of how difficult it was to get them back on board uh, coming out of the pandemic period. And so, uh, so you're going to have an economy uh, probably moving fits and starts in 2023, but one that is we think is more predisposed to uh, experiencing a recession at some point. And again, the big question is just how how, how deep. Uh, that recession will be. What else are we working on or what else are you working on that we need to be aware of as we start to wrap up December? And, you know, I just signed my last paycheck for the year. It's kind of like weird. I'm For me, I'm looking at my 401k next year and my health savings account and things like that. What are you looking at? Mm-hmm. Well, you recently um, uh, published a, a market view uh, update or for 2023 and uh, and I kind of alluded to it just a minute ago. I think that, <clears throat> like the economy, the stock market is also going to move in fits and starts uh, throughout next year. Uh, but it's going to be challenged to really sustain, you know, kind of a bullish bias in the face of what we think will be declining earnings estimates. Uh, so that'll be a, a headwind uh, for much of next year as kind of the economic reality clashes with inflated earnings estimates. You're going to see some economic slowing, if not a recession, and uh, the writing will be on the wall uh, in terms of the effects of that with more companies, we think, you know, lowering their earnings expectations for for the full year next year. Uh, and that will start to come into play, you know, most likely toward the latter part of January as the fourth quarter earnings reporting period unfolds. Uh, and so that'll be the first kind of big roadblock, we think, for the stock market in in 2023. But, um, you know, so you're going to have this transitional period where the market's going to have to get adjusted to that, uh, you know, lower earnings estimate uh, reality. And uh, but potentially could set up for a better second half of the year, um, you know, as the weakening in environment ultimately, okay. you know, leads the Fed to start. Uh, job boning and maybe even in fact cut, you know cutting rates and the market will will respond probably favorably to that but it's going to have a, a bumpy transition period before it kind of 
uh, is is comfortable that the earnings estimates have been lowered enough so that there's a sense that you're buying into some true values as opposed to a value trap. Um, but you know, it will likely be more of a stock picker market. I know that's a bit of a cliche, but um, but that you know, in terms of allocations, I mean, I think that your point of emphasis is to really you know uh, look to you know industry leaders across all sectors, um, not necessarily just you know favoring you know the counter cyclical sectors in a slowing economic environment. I think there's still you know opportunities to be had across all these sectors, and so you want to favor those larger companies that have positive free cash flow, pay a nice dividend, uh, and have a you know a good balance sheet uh, that are going to weather the economic storm and come out of it just fine. And so, and I think you can probably discover those companies across the whole uh, range of sectors as opposed to just trying to pinpoint, you know, you know, one or two sectors along the way. <laughs> I've got a fairly uncomplicated strategy question. How much, and just maybe give me a theory, um, you don't have to give me a scientific number. How much of the lowered expectations do you think is already built in? Because, you know, anecdotally, I'm doing a show every day about I'm seeing Salesforce cutting their earnings and cutting their headcount and Intel and Facebook. And um, we're seeing companies like Toyota shut down factory lines in the United States. So it seems like they're getting ahead of the earnings cuts. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I think you're saying the reality is you want more. And I'm saying, isn't that enough? Or maybe it's rolling from sector to sector. Or I don't know how to mm-hmm. verbalize the question, but we could have an okay well, I, 2023 if it's baked into the cake some levels. Yeah, right. And, and you know, I, I, our contention is that it's not fully baked into the cake yet, right? Um, you okay. know, if we look at facts that consensus shows that the 2023 uh, earnings estimate was was around two hundred and fifty dollars per share in the middle of twenty twenty two. It's now two hundred thirty dollars and change. Um, that's about five and a half percent higher than what's expected for twenty twenty two. And uh, if you get into an environment where you have like no economic growth or or the recession that we think is going to be part of the equation, um, you know you typically see you know earnings decline in, in an environment like that. Uh, so we think there's still some some room to go, uh, and that that's not fully reflected in the market multiple right now, which is around 17 times uh, forward 12 month earnings, and that's that's roughly in line with the 10 year historical average. But if you get you know say another 10 to 20 percent cut in earnings estimates, well, you're not really you know trading at that average multiple that you think you are today, and so that's what I'm kind of alluding to that you're not necessarily buying into a market at a true value right now, you could be buying in more to a market that's a little bit of a value trap because the earnings estimates haven't been marked down enough. And so uh, we think that's going to be the headwind here uh, in the early part of 2023. So the emphasis would be on favoring those industry leaders, again, that have, you know, again, the positive free cash flow, good balance sheets, um, you know, have a track record of riding out these more challenging economic periods and coming out of them stronger. Uh, and, uh, and you know, that's kind of how we would be approaching, you know, the early part of, of, of next year. We only are going to have about 10 seconds for a response, but are the strategists not lowering their broad S&P 500 numbers? But like I saw an analyst today crush Best Buy and, and lower the analyst expectations. And is that why it's a stock picker's market? Because some stocks have been beaten up, whereas as a group, the strategists are saying not enough in the whole S&P 500. About 10 seconds. Right. Well, mindful that I've got 10 seconds to say it. I think that that is correct, Rob. <laughs> That's pretty much Fair enough. what's going on here. Yeah. I'll re-ask the question next week because it deserves a longer answer. Thanks very much. It's Patrick O'Hare. He's with Briefing.com, a reliable source of international and domestic business news. I start my day every day with his page one. I end it with his big picture column on Friday. So, Lots going on at the site. Check it out. Questions about Social Security? Check out the Social Security Retirement Guide at robblack.com. That's robblack.com, powered by EP Wealth. Motor Trend, which anytime I see those two words together, I always go back to the Night Ranger song, Sister Christian. Motoring. What's your price for flight? Um, motoring is a phenomenon on the East Coast of driving up and down the main highway of a city and checking out the opposite sex while you're driving by, doing a little cat calling, a little whistling, and killing a Friday night. 
Let's go motoring tonight. Weird, right? I hope I didn't just ruin that song for you. So Motor Trend is saying Ford's electric F-150 is the 2023 truck of the year. This is a big deal. Let's talk a little bit about this. First and foremost, I'm going to give you a little antidote. I own a getaway home, vacation home, whatever you want to call it, a place where my kids feel safe up in the mountains where it's cold. The electric vehicles don't do well in cold. The people who live in Lake Tahoe and Truckee and Nevada all say, don't bring your Teslas up to the mountains when it's cold. A couple of Teslas got stuck right in front of a ski resort. And in the good old days, the plows would have just, you know, knocked them off the road, but not now. So it, it, it muddled traffic big time. So I'm a little leery that the world's going to go all electric vehicle just on that one anecdotal thing. How do they operate in cold? The all-electric F-150 is Motor Trend's favorite new pickup truck, nabbing the magazine's coveted 2023 Truck of the Year award. The F-150 isn't just the best truck this year. Motor Trend says it's the best truck ever. It's got instantaneous torque and a standout ride. It makes handling um, stand out. It's a big win for Ford in the wider transition of the United States and other countries to more clean vehicles, a zero emission version of America's most popular truck, the Ford F series. It's been seen as a crucial, critical stepping stone to mass acceptance. If you go out on the road today, let's not do Palo Alto in this experiment, but if you go out on any other Bay Area road, you're going to see a lot of Ford F-150 trucks, uh, more so than Teslas or electric vehicles. That's why this one's important. Electric cars only make up about 5% of the U.S. car sales today. That's going to grow and grow and grow. So having the right category, trucks, is important. Motor Trend is also noting that like the F-150 Lightning, $52,000 starting price, it's lower than other electric vehicle trucks. It's able to provide electricity to homes, job sites, and campsites. Um, the big knock on electric trucks also, not that they don't handle well in cold, that's, that's mine, is that the, it's a weak spot is towing. And there's a lot of YouTube videos of Ford F-150 lightning truck owners going, I thought it had a 300 mile range when I had it fully charged. And I put a load of wood in the back and it didn't get it there. It didn't get, it didn't even get 80 miles. And you put it uphill and in the cold, you're, you're dead in the water. You're not towing. You're not, you're not trucking. I know you're saying you're going to turn motoring into trucking. Yeah. You're not trucking around and doing truck kind of stuff. So this is a big car. This is a big, important one. Again, do we eliminate gas powered? I don't know, but I'm not smart enough to figure that one out. Ticketmaster is in hot water again, facing a big fine after unprecedented number of people were sold fake tickets to a bad buddy concert try to buy your tickets only from Ticketmaster or StubHub. Uh, Every other place to me feels, I'm not going to say sketchy. I'm 23% happier and nicer this year than last year. And I'm going to carry that over into 2023. I'm not going to say the word sketchy. I'm just going to say, I've seen a lot of people lose money, big money on expectations for a concert. Getting your money back from a second tier or third tier player if the band cancels due to COVID is going to be a little bit tougher. So other stories of note, I want to hit this one one more time. Preliminary results released yesterday indicate that an experimental mRNA cancer vaccine from Moderna was effective against melanoma when combined with Merck's immunotherapy known as Keytruda. I am a pasty Caucasian. I come from a long line of pasty Caucasians, a little bit of Scottish and English blood in my body. Um, I am pale. I I go to the beach with long sleeve shirts on ever since I turned 21 because I'd rather not burn. I'd rather enjoy the tropical air, but not the tropical sun. Um, The combo reduced the risk of recurrence or death by 44%. My sister, she is a uh, pale Caucasian as well. She's had melanoma. Um, She's had uh, skin cancers removed. Um, it's something that I do on a regular basis, get checked because, uh, I am, how shall we say the sun looks at me and goes, (laughs) 
I'm going to get you, Mr. Black. So no FTX Super Bowl ad commercials this year. The House Scheduled Financial Services Committee yesterday talked about the collapse of FTX. They got the current CEO, John Ray. He happened to be the same guy who oversaw the collapse of Enron. His specialty is going into companies that have, have committed frauds and bankruptcies and figuring out how can we claw back as many assets for the creditors as possible. U.S. Attorney General Damian Williams called it one of the biggest financial frauds in American history. John Ray, the current FTX CEO, says he's there was an unprecedented lack of documentation, no record keeping whatsoever in many cases, and the employees even used QuickBooks to manage a $32 billion dollar uh, company's finances. That's not acceptable. Um, Ray's quote of the day that resonates with me, this was just old fashioned embezzlement. This is just taking money from customers and using it on your own purpose, not sophisticated at all. Congress is getting involved and Congress wants oversight to be given to the SEC or somebody. Um, even though it's worthy of note that Congress is considering the crypto consumer protection bill that Sam Bankman freed, he had backed before the FTX collapse, which would have basically put a nail in his own coffin if it got through. Um, this is messy. This is gross. This is heinous. Um, I want nothing to do with cryptocurrencies. I'm going to I've put a six month ban on ever even considering it for myself. Needs more time. Needs more time. I don't have to be early. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black. Thanks so much for listening. I do appreciate it. I will talk to you soon. For more information about EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com.